Welcome to another training session with Christian Education Ministries. Today, I'm pleased to have with me uh, Steve Kern. He, Steve is a former vice moderator of Synod and also a, a an elder at the Devonshire Road Presbyterian Church where he's been an elder for many years and um, a great friend of mine and one who I can tell you knows this what we're, our subject today pretty well. Today we're going to be talking about the role of elder and deacon. And Steve, we're glad to have you here today, sir. Well, it's glad. I'm glad to be with you uh, today and hopefully uh, provide some insights. What we we're looking at and what we want to cover today is we've, Steve and I have been talking quite a bit and we realized that um, the role of elder and deacon is, you, is clearly stated in the form of government, but we've realized that, um, Steve, there's a lot of elders and deacons sometimes that really don't understand their role like they should. You want to respond to that? you agree? Or? Yeah, what, uh, what I have found in my experiences is uh, really two things. Uh, number one, new deacons and new elders are coming on both of those boards are rarely uh, given a copy of the form of government and rarely are they encouraged to read the appropriate uh, sections of the form of government, deacons chapter five and elders chapter six, in order that they might understand their responsibilities well. They're just, they are elected by the congregation and they begin to sit on those particular boards uh, without any guidance, training, or understanding as to what their particular roles and responsibilities are. Exactly. Now, you, I was thinking as we talk about elders and deacons, we often look at the qualifications, and of course they're seen in Scripture um, through Timothy and through Titus, so you, we can look through there and we can see the qualifications of someone as an elder, as a deacon. Um, but I, I do think a lot of people don't realize that it's specifically in our form of government, chapters five and six, just like you said, it's, it's laid out. Roles, responsibilities, and there may be some situations where you wonder, well, you know, who is responsible for what? And uh, matter of fact, I asked Steve even before this meeting uh, situation that um, concerning um, being an elder, and sure enough, there it was right there in the, in the form of government and answered the question. So we have answers out there. Uh, we just need to kind of dig in and make sure that we know these chapters and, and to, to know them well. And I agree with you, Steve, every elder and deacon needs to read those chapters. Steve, today I also want to just kind of ask you some questions to kind of look at the basics of these two positions. Sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about elders. In the elder, it says an elder is a shepherd. Um, what, what does that look like? Well, it can, it can take various looks depending upon the, uh, the people themselves and the makeup of the congregation. But, uh, you know, we're told in scripture that the shepherd knows his sheep. And so the first aspect that I would say of shepherding is that uh, a shepherd really needs to know and have a relationship with each of their sheep. Uh, to the point uh, that the, the relationship will allow the, uh, the shepherd himself to be able to be an encouragement to each of those sheep in the congregation that are his responsibility and that the relationship will be so good that when a situation comes up in the life of one of the sheep, uh, they feel free enough to be able to call upon their shepherd uh, for assistance and guidance, and, uh, maybe a little coaching, or maybe just uh, just be in a position to be able to make specific prayer uh, when someone has a need. But it all go it all goes to basically having that initial relationship, I believe. I, you stated something, I think, and I, forgive me for interrupting you, but um, I, I hear this concept a little bit from some people. Well, 
the pastor's the shepherd. He's the one that we're paying to go visit people. He's the one that we're paying to, you know, to do all this. Um, an elder it has that responsibility of being a shepherd. You agree? Oh, I agree. In fact, if you if you look at the list of responsibilities for an elder in chapter six, and they're listed A through U, you will find that the very first responsibility is to be a shepherd to the flock. And different churches do this different ways. In smaller churches, it may be in an informal fashion as churches uh, get larger, it probably needs to be in a more formal way. In our particular church, every member of the church is assigned to one of the elders as their shepherding elder, and they know who that elder is. And that elder has a responsibility to keep contact, to develop the relationship that they have with that particular person or that particular family or couple. Uh, I know in my particular case, I have uh, some families that uh, don't have children. It's just a husband and wife. Uh, I have three particular widows who've lost their husbands and uh, they are on my shepherding list. And uh, I'm responsible for making sure that they are cared for that they know that they're cared for, that they know that they have someone that when, when, when a life challenge or something comes up and they have to face it, that they're not facing it alone, that they can, they can have, they, they have a relationship well enough with the shepherding elder that good communication can be there and the shepherding elder can be very aware of what their situation is it does two things. Number one, it, it helps that shepherding elder know how to pray for that mm. church member. Number two, that shepherding elder may be able to bring other resources to bear on helping to solve that particular issue, whatever it may be. It, each situation is a little bit different. Sometimes we may have to, uh, to involve uh, the deacons because the deacons have a responsibility for the care of widows and orphans, uh, clear in scripture. Uh, but anyhow, the, the, the point of contact can't always be the pastor. And there are cases where, in many cases, in some of our smaller churches, where they don't have a full-time pastor. They have a pastor who preaches on Sunday. Right. And that's all that pastor's responsible for doing is coming into the congregation and preach. Right. Primary responsibility, in my humble opinion, goes to the elder hmm. for all shepherding. Well, just thinking about what you uh, thinking about what you just said, I think it would be amazing too to, that you would know if you were in a elder meeting, you would know the prayer request. You would know the member said you oversee and so you'd be able to pray more effectively as a session for your congregation the fact that your shepherds are doing their job of looking after their sheep and um, i love what you said also about you know as you have your particular people that you're looking over and if there's a physical need or something that's going on that you can easily contact a deacon and um say hey there's a need Therefore, you know, it's just not a need that's missed. You're actually picking up on needs that other people probably can't pick up on because you have that relationship. And then, therefore, the deacons are able to um, do their job even better. But that, that's great with shepherding. What are some, what do you say, some, some obstacles in shepherding? Uh, some of the obstacles in shepherding, and they, they can go two ways. No, uh, one of the obstacles sometimes is differences in personalities. Uh, some members of the congregation don't or may not feel especially close to 
or understand the personality of their shepherding elder. On the other side of the equation, it takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of wisdom and discernment for a shepherding elder to gain an understanding of the personality of the church member. Some church members won't call asking for help. They expect the elder to be the one to initiate the contact and to maintain the relationship with them. Uh, and that, and that can be, that can be challenging at times. So, and again, it depends, you know, we're, we're in this denomination in this ARP church, we have some very small churches. We have some very large churches and the approach to shepherding, uh, probably needs to have some flexibility according to the size of the church and, and to the nature of the, of the congregate members. Uh, I know some, I know some larger churches where the, the pastor has asked for a report from each elder at every, at each elders meeting, each meeting of the session to give a report on their sheep. Mm. Uh, I have seen that done in writing in a very formal way where the, the pastor requests that every elder turn in a written form, which lists their latest contact and any, any pertinent information. Uh, obviously, uh, privacy has a, a part uh, to play in this too. And in smaller congregations, uh, it, that probably is more than what's necessary, but it still doesn't, it still doesn't change the responsibility for us to understand as elders, for us as elders to understand who our church members are and know enough about them and work at, at continuing to develop a relationship with them so that they feel a part of the family and the most important thing I think is that they know they're cared for. Right, super. I want to jump to a different thing as far as elders go. In the form of government, it says that uh, the elders are responsible for worship. Uh, what does that look like, Steve? Well, first of all, uh, we do have, besides the form of government, we do have a book of common worship. Correct. Right. And uh, those guidelines have been approved by the uh, denomination as a whole. And they provide a framework that the elders can go to and look at. And in there, it will let us know what is normally considered parts of worship. Obviously, uh, there are various aspects to worship and they can be handled in various ways. And the, the book of worship really gives us that flexibility, but, uh, establishing worship and a, and a, a corporate worship plan can involve things such as how many hymns are we going to sing in worship? What liturgy are we going to use? Uh, what type of uh, what type of prayers are going to be? Are we going to have a uh, our church uh, in particular likes to have a pastoral prayer, uh, praying for the needs of the people as we know them and as we have their permission in order to 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 pray about in a public uh, setting. Obviously, preaching is a large part of corporate worship. And the session has a responsibility to have oversight of what is preached from the pulpit, how it's preached, uh, if there's any questions about uh, what has been said in the sermon, then it's their responsibility to uh, engage the pastor uh, in what, what has been preached and to uh, to reach an understanding about whether that was appropriate or inappropriate. 
So all of these are parts, you know, there's, there's the giving aspect, uh, the collecting of tithes and offerings. And so uh, all of these have to do with what is acceptable in worship and what is practical in worship and what is desired by the leadership of the church in worship. Excellent. One, uh, great way to put that. One of the other things we see is um, roles of an elder is to promote the spiritual growth among the flock. Um, what are some ideas? What comes to your mind through there? In, per, in promoting spiritual growth, I would say that uh, every program that the church has within its walls of the building uh, have to do with spiritual growth. Men's and women's Bible studies, uh, music programs for children, youth, and, and adults, um, programs that focus on missions and missionary efforts. And so when we have sheep that are only participating in one aspect of the life of the church, for example, they may only be there for Sunday morning corporate worship. I believe we have a responsibility to try to encourage them to be a part of other activities that go on in the life of the church. I know our particular church has an Acts 242 Wednesday evening program. Well, we've had to modify that a little bit because of COVID-19. So we no longer, we're not having meals right now, but we do have a time of Bible study. We do have fellowship. We do have a time of prayer. And, and if we have members of the church who are not showing up for that particular program, they're missing out on, an, on a uh, spiritual growth aspect of the church. If we have folks who are not, uh, and some people can't, we, un we understand that different people have different job requirements and family responsibilities, but and that's part of the leadership's responsibility is to try to, to make these uh, various activities in the life of the church of, uh, available on days of the week and times of the day and so forth that, uh, that are likely to get the most number of participants. Uh, we still need to be encouraging people to have a fuller, uh, more vibrant church uh, life by participating in more than just Sunday morning, as an example. Yeah, I think also as, as shepherds, you look out at your flock and you can tell those who are probably, uh, I use the sheep as an example, those who have been not as nourished. And so, you know, you would like for them to see your shepherd. As a shepherd, you want to see them growing daily. It's a daily walk with the Lord. It's a daily growing. And maybe to the point, making sure they're exactly, you're providing activities and programs, but also, you know, daily making sure that, you know, maybe coming aside them and saying, hey, here's a great devotion. You might want to, you know, try this and, or, you know, making sure those sheep are, are well fed. And that is a, a part of what an elder is, is, is to, to oversee the spiritual growth. That, what is the difference between an elder and a deacon? People have asked me that before. What would you say? I would say the difference uh, between the two is a difference of focus more than anything else. Uh, the, if we go back and look at Acts and we understand that the, the, uh, disciples that the disciples realized that they could not be all things to all people. They could not meet the uh, their spiritual responsibilities 
and the temporal responsibilities to the members of a growing young church. They, they understood the, a, a need for the deacon position. And so the deacon position has a different focus than the elder does in the life of the church. Now, now we have churches, we have buildings, we have property. In some cases we have vehicles. Uh, we have kitchens in a lot of our churches. There are various aspects, and this division of labor, I will call it, or focus, allows these two groups to focus on certain aspects of the life of the church to the benefit of the entire church. Excellent. Good. Um... I was thinking about the passage you were talking about where uh, there's a problem and with the church, with the Hebraic Jews and the Grecian Jews, and they, they come together and they say, hey, there's some uh, widows that were overlooked. We missed, we feel overlooked them. And they come to the apostles and that group is saying, well, we're, our, our ministry is to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And as what we would have put as elders, prayer, ministry is word and um, they, and so they established a group and seven men who were actually knew what the Grecians knew they were actually all had Grecian names and they were able to help that group in, as a mercy ministry and so um, excellent on there on the point of service for, for um, so you have two groups elders and you have deacons represented there one of the things in the form of government says the elder shall supervise the work of the deacons. How does that translate to you? Yeah, the, um, again, I go back to the fact that the, the smaller church is probably less informal or the less formal this needs to be, the more informal uh, that supervision can be. But uh, when you have church property, when you have members who are widows, uh, somebody needs, so there needs to be some methodology in order to ensure that responsibilities and things that need to be done in the life of the church are not, they don't fall through the cracks. Um, and the, the deacons themselves can take a great load off of the elders by taking care of repairs on things like air conditioning units, uh, can take uh, and make sure that the building is safe for people uh, as they come and go for worship. Uh, we've got situations now with um, with people uh, with walkers, with wheelchairs, with all kinds of things, and we need to be able to accommodate them um, and make sure that the, especially with COVID-19, we uh, have given deacons responsibilities for the sanitation, the cleanliness, uh, social distancing, all of these sorts of things, uh, given as a focus point to the uh, diaconate so that, again, the session can still focus on the spiritual aspect uh, of the continuing growth in the life of the church. Excellent. I just want to encourage uh, those who are watching this, we thank you that please go to chapter six in the form of government. And there's a list of all these, what the session is to be, is to be doing and how it is, what its roles, you'll see it some church discipline and um, worship. And so encourage you to, to make sure that you could go through there. We just wanted to hit a few of those things and Steve appreciates you hitting us on with, the, with that. I want to switch roles a little bit. Um, to deacons. Um, 
First thing, the, and this is going to be in chapter five. The form of government says that the deacon is a role of sympathy and service after example of Christ. I know you probably you've already touched a little bit on this, but um, a role of sympathy and service. Yeah, uh, it, it actually puts that focus uh, of sympathy and service on the deacons. However, I would say that every church leadership position is a position of service. Again, I go back to that use of word focus. If we're focusing on the roles uh, and responsibilities for a deacon, it is, again, it is the care of the members uh, in, a, in the form of their uh, day-to-day -day life. Um, I'll give you some, uh, give you some examples. Uh, we have a man in surgery right now in a local hospital for a heart procedure. And his wife is at home, is homebound. And one of the deacons picked the man up this morning, took him to his hospital, and is there with him, is staying there now until he comes out of surgery. That's one example. That's a great example. We have had, uh, we have had widows with limited financial means have things happen at their house a broken plumbing pipe, uh, a air conditioning unit break down in the middle of the summer. And either one or more deacons uh, were able to uh, make contact and to get that unit repaired and get the comfort level back. <laughs> for that person in their home with air conditioning in the middle of July. And so there, there's a couple of examples. Our deacons really look after lots of things. There, there's another aspect too that, that we have noticed in our church with COVID-19, for example, we have noticed that there are more needy people from outside the church approaching the church asking for help. And why we're seeing more needs now than 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 I'm aware of of our church seeing in the last thirty years. Wow. Yet what we realized was we did not have a formal policy for how we investigated, looked into it to determine if it was a real need or whether it was a panhandler going from church to church. So the, the, the session has tasked our deacons with coming up with a draft church policy for how we handle our contact with people who contact us looking for money, looking for some sort of an assistance. So that's one of the things that our deacons are, are focused on now is coming up with a policy that can work in almost all situations. Obviously it can't be very specific, but the, I mean, there's some things we can do as a, we're a smaller church. There's some things we can do financially, but in many cases, the needs of the truly needy need to be referred to other organizations, charitable organizations in the area that actually focus on meeting those needs for people and we can act as a referral. So that, those are a couple of examples of some of the ways that the, 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 some of the places that our deacons focus on and how that can be most helpful to both our church members as well as members of the community. How do the deacons, um, what kind of role do they have financially within the church? Well, by the form of government, the deacons are responsible for the budget. And uh, that's a large nebulous area. 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, the deacons are responsible for putting together the budget for the calendar year every year. Uh, they are responsible for taking a look at what our what the church's uh, financial position is, uh, what the donations uh, are, how they're coming in, what the spending needs are. Uh, some things are, are fixed uh, amounts and, and, they're, and the fixed things. You always have to pay the electric bill as an example. Some things are discretionary spending where you, you, you put priorities and decide that you're gonna to give to this organization or that organization. But the form of government tasks the deacons with the preparation of the budget. They are responsible for the oversight of the uh, treasurer of the church. Now, the treasurer should be keeping up with things on the month to month and day to day basis, but the oversight of that treasurer is done by the deacons. And it's a responsibility of the deacons at an appropriate time to, to put together that budget and to present it to the session for session approval. Now we can go into more details on that, but that's, that's, the, lar that's the large picture. Excellent. So they are to prepare the budget to work on it, make sure. And um, I got also here to, en to encourage stewardship within the church. If they're looking at the budget and as they're talking to their uh, the members to encourage the good stewardship to ensure that needs are being met within the church. Yeah, it, that's absolutely important. And what, uh, what some churches, what I've seen done in some churches is, is they prepare a basic budget and, and send that to the session. When the session approves it, they promote it to the congregation and every budget has to be approved by the congregation in, in a congregational meeting. But there are different ways of doing things. Sometimes uh, two alternative budgets might be proposed to the congregation. Uh, so there's different ways and methodologies of doing this, but still it's the deacon's responsibility to put that budget together in a responsible way and they present it. Um, let me, if, if we have time, Budgets are, are should be annual January 1 through December 31st to keep in in um, in good reporting uh, position because uh, what we do in, in our churches uh, gets reported to our presbyteries as well as to central services for uh, for statistical uh, accounting. Uh, a good time for the set for the deacons to start working on the budget is in September. Uh, I, our elders just received the deacon approved uh, a budget for next year uh, last week via email. Uh, we can look at every item that the that the deacons are proposing and what they're proposing is the amount. And at our next meeting, the deacons will actually have a joint meeting with the session and they will pres formally present that budget to the session and the session will have the opportunity to ask any questions if they have any about why did you budget this amount in this particular area? So while you, you can't take any action in a joint meeting, they'll present the budget and, and then they'll be dismissed and the, and the session will have uh, an opportunity to, to look at that budget clearly and will eventually approve a budget to be sent to the congregation. So, but it all starts with a diaconate. 
the elders will, uh, uh, after they approve the budget and any other business that, that they may have, will determine a date for a congregational meeting at which that meeting, the budget will be presented to the congregation for an up or down vote. Now, again, we go back to the form of government, which gives us some guidelines and it tells us we can't have a congregational meeting without at least one week's notification to the congregation. <clears throat> I would say that a better practice is to give two weeks of notification. And in our church, the way we like to do that is we put it in the bulletin and we announce it from the pulpit that in two weeks, we're going to have a congregational meeting at which we will consider the budget. We will elect officers for the, for the upcoming year. Uh, we will have election for treasurer, which is an annual election. We'll have an election for a congregational chairman. Again, that is a, an annual event. And we will have election for uh, deacons and elders. And so if we plan this far enough out, the budget may be the most important thing or may that, you know, is gonna come up at that congregational meeting, but that'll be scheduled. So when we start a budget in September, we get it to the elders in October and we go through the process of adjusting it maybe and approving it. When we get to the first week, the first Sunday or the second Sunday in December, we can have our congregational meeting and we actually print the copy of the budget two weeks in advance and have it available for the church members to pick up a copy at the church and to take it home with them, to study it, to call an elder if, or a deacon if they have any question about an item in the budget. And first or second Sunday in, De in December, we have that meeting and we get, and now we have a budget and we have new, and we have new leader positions that we've elected and we're ready on January 1 when we go into a new year with everything we need. We know what our but our finances are, what our budget's going to be, and who our leadership's going to be. And you said you had that meeting around in November, is that what y'all do? I'm sorry, I missed that. Excuse me, what, when you have the meeting, the congregational meeting, usually you say you're not, you usually, the, the budget's prepared in September, it's brought to the um, elders in October, and then the congregational meeting is end of November or December. Yeah, December. We'll, we'll establish the congregational meeting usually the first or second Sunday in December. And two weeks before that, we will have copies of the budget out and available for the review of all the members. Excellent. Right. And I, I know, Steve, I know you well enough too that um, a lot of times when those new elders or deacons are first come in and that we are you're voted they voted on and even probably before that you guys have done some training with them and they know they you're making sure they've read their cloth their what they should be doing and so just um, encourage churches to make sure that you don't neglect training these guys as we, we ordain them put them in position make sure that uh, people won't need to know what is expected of them and what their role is yeah, the, uh, again, the form of government gives us pretty specific guidelines about election of, of officers. In, and uh, it's, a, it's all in chapter eight of the form of government. And there's three actual parts to it, to it before you get something, before someone is elected and installed. Number one is first of all, a nomination. Second of all, the form of government uses the term a certification or what we might say is a vetting of this individual to see if they meet the biblical qualifications and to see if they understand what their roles and responsibilities would be if they are elected. And once vetted or certified by the session, then they are put up on the ballot 
for the congregation to vote on. And the way we do things, that while this is not clear or, or uh, required in the form of government, if even if we only have two vacancies on the session and we put forward two nominees, we still use a ballot, although it's not required, and we give every member of the congregation an opportunity to vote yes or no for this individual in a private ballot setting. So when, so when we have elected a new elder or a new deacon, we know that, that uh, by using that ballot system, we know that, we, that those individuals have the support of the congregation. Okay, that's great. Super. Last thing I wanted to cover about deacons, and I think you've done a good job of this already, is um, so the form of government says that deacons generally care for the general needs of the church. Um, general needs, how might you define that general needs? Uh, I would define general needs as anything having to do with the, with the building the the physical plant of the church uh, condition of parking lots uh, lighting around the church on the outside uh, landscaping uh, if you have uh, basketball courts or that sort of thing the condition of the goalposts you know as examples if you have outbuildings or storage buildings, the conditions of those buildings, the condition of the whole exterior of the church property. And then when we go to the inside, we go to the, to the cleanliness, the appearance, the neatness, those aspects, uh, which, New, some people, when new families or individuals come to the church, a great question to ask is, what is there about this church that would make me want to come back to this church? If they see things in dirty, unkept, disorganized, not well lit, not clean bathrooms, those things are negatives that will keep people from coming back to that church because there are all kinds of options that people have. So the deacons really have a responsibility for the overall condition of the inside and the outside of the facility that you call your church. Excellent. Say thank you for just this brief time of just going over some basics of the roles of elders and deacons. I want to let our, con our um, you and audience know that Steve is available. Um, if you've got a question, I'm going to put his uh, email here up, and I just encourage you to call, ask Steve questions. But also, I can tell you, as a knowing Steve as well as I do, and the friendship we have, if you didn't want him to come and help, maybe explain some things even to your um, elders and deacons. I'm sure he'd be glad to, and willing to help in that area as well. Steve, thank you, my friend, so much for your time. And I know we just kind of dug in a little bit, but I do want to make sure people realize there's chapters five and six in the form of government. And it, a simple thing, if you don't have a, an updated version of the form of government or you don't have a copy, strongly encourage you, just all you got to do is go to arpbookstore.com and you can order those there. Um, matter of fact, we even just recently have a... Uh, new full version of the Korean form of government. And so please, you know, be sure to, to pick that up if that's your part of that Korean church. Steve, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, I hope this has been uh, a help and will be a continuing help to some of our folks who, uh, who are looking to have a, a higher level of excellence in the life of their church.